Hello everyone, it's great to have so many of you here. We're really sorry that we had to turn some people away, but unfortunately we did say that the doors were going to open at 5.30 for members. So, apologies for that. Uh, but we're really grateful that Professor Nat accepted our invitation to speak here today, and we're really excited for the talk. But before that, I'm going to spend just a few minutes to talk about the UCL NeuroSoc and some of our upcoming events. So, at the moment, we are the largest science society at UCL, and it's only the second year we're running. Uh, and we've received so much uh, support from our university, professor, lecturers, uh, members of staff and students all included, but also from the public and uh, other organizations. So this is why we promise that we're always going to aim to bring to you better and bigger events. So for the next few months, we have quite a few talks already sorted, scheduled. Uh, in just two days, on this Wednesday, there's going to be our monthly research talk, all themed around schizophrenia. Uh, on the 27th of February, we will have Professor Reisman, in which he will discuss his research that allowed a patient who was paralyzed to walk again after a transplantation of bulbar olfactory and sheeting cells to the spinal cord. Finally, I would like to talk about our biggest project yet, which is a neuro art exhibition, a part of the brain and mental health. So this art exhibition is the goal to raise awareness about mental illnesses and also to raise funds for the charity SANE, and our aim is ultimately 50,000 pounds, so we will really need everyone's help for this. Uh, SANE fights stigmatization, provides support for people who suffer from mental illnesses, and funds research in this field. All we want you to do, amateur and professional artists, is to enter this competition by being inspired with the broad title, The Brain and Mental Health. So all work will be exhibited, there is a chance of winning 350,000... Uh, sorry. <laughs> 350,000 prizes. customize one of Saint's Black Dog campaign statues and to be featured in a magazine and various websites. Moreover, all the artwork will be auctioned and the artist can claim up to 50% of the sale. So, please, all you have to do is just be a member to participate and we hope you'll support us in this, to raise money for this fantastic important cause and you can do this by either entering yourself, spreading the word or simply by coming to the exhibition. But now, enough about the society, I'd like to talk about the reason why we're all here today. So, Professor Nutt studied medicine in Downing College of Cambridge and completed his medical training at Guy's Hospital in London. He then completed his psychiatric training in Oxford, uh, where he became a lecturer and later a welcome senior fellow in psychiatry. For the two following years, Professor Nutt was chief of the section um, of clinical science in the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism in the US. When he then came back to the UK in 1988, he then set up a psychopharmacology unit in Bristol University. He then, in 2008, moved to Imperial College London, where he is currently the Edmund J. Safra Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology and the Director of Neuropsychopharmacology Unit in the Division of Brain Sciences. Moreover, he is also currently the Chair of the Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, now known as Drug Science, which was formed following the controversy caused by NAP being dismissed from the Governmental Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs due to his comments about the state of drug policy in the UK. In addition, he is now president of the European Brain Council, a fellow of Royal Colleges of Physicians and of Psychiatrists, and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Now, <coughs> Professor Nutt has already expressed his views to the general public about therapeutic as well as illicit drugs, their harms and their classifications, which is what he will talk here about today. So, drugs and the brain is a time for neuroscience enlightenment. Please welcome <laughs> Professor Nutt. the biggest audience I've ever had, so uh, I hope you didn't think there were going to be free samples. <laughs> so before I get into my talk, I just want to talk, mention to you another a neuroscience society, this is the British Neuroscience Association, which I once was president of, and, uh, which now I support. So uh, it's, uh, 
essentially it's a core organisation for any of you who are interested in neuroscience, uh, particularly at the level of undergraduate to postgraduate. And any postdocs in the audience who are looking for a conference to go to this year, then I strongly recommend this one. This is our second festival. We had the first one in London two years ago, which is hugely successful. This one is in Edinburgh. So if you're a postdoc and you're interested in neuroscience, it, this is a really um, important uh, opportunity for you. So how many of you actually are neuroscientists? It's a good sign. There's hope for the future. Okay, so let me just uh, let's move into the, the core of my talk then. So some of you will have seen this image. Oh, it's getting a bit dated now. This is uh, my being sacked. Uh, it's a caricature of me on the front of the week. And uh, it's uh, a rather interesting uh, caricature for a number of reasons, but the, the most important one is or the scales of justice down here. Because I was sacked for arguing that beer and cigarettes uh, were actually causing more problems uh, to the health of people in the UK than other chemicals that people were getting hysterical about, like methadrone. Uh, and also, I was arguing that cannabis was certainly uh, overvalued, overrated as a harm, harm producing substance, and being dis was disproportionately being penalised. And that created enormous uncomfort, discomfort in the government, and that's why they sacked me. But this particular front page was amazing because in the top left hand corner we had Wandry <laughs> Agassiz. <Agassi's laughs> <Agassi's laughs> I won't go through the whole story, but the bottom line is Andre Agassi won Wimbledon, tested positive for methamphetamine in his urine, and got away with it. And he got away with it because he was too important to fail. Uh, you couldn't uh, essentially stop the number one tennis player in the world playing because he tested positive for an illegal substance. So he got away with it, but the majority of you who test positive in other branches of life won't get away with it. And there's a, that's, a, that's really a very disturbing analysis of the situation. That the drug laws are arbitrary scientifically and they're also applied rather randomly. And that's something I feel quite, quite uh, concerned about. I, I would like, at the very least, there to be some semblance of justice in what we do. So hopefully science can give us the driver for justice. Now, one thing that's happened in the last couple of years is that the Americans have caught up with us, or at least with me, so now I know that I was... <laughs> <laughs> and truly, that statement by Obama that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol was remarkable. Possibly the first uh, honest and accurate statement an American president has made in the last couple of centuries. <laughs> But more than that, it, it, it stopped what would have been a civil war in America, because as you probably know, uh, the majority of American states now have, have made cannabis and medical cannabis legal. But unfortunately, it's still illegal at the federal level. And there have been huge tensions between the DEA and the feds trying to stop pharmacists uh, giving out medical cannabis. And it could have turned extremely unpleasant. Uh, and Obama decided he was going to put a stop to that by saying there was no need to prosecute people using cannabis as a medicine, which is a, a very wise thing to say. But it has ramifications way beyond America, because uh, really until that statement, international drugs policy was dictated by the US. They funded the agencies that maintained, that supposedly maintained the, the war on drugs. And they dictated the philosophy by which we all ran our internal drug policies. And when an American president says, well, we can no longer control our own states in terms of the UN conventions on cannabis, that means that they completely lost any authority internationally. So we are now free to do what we want, just like American states are free to do what they like. And this hopefully will be the sign of a, a significant sea change in the way we in this country and other countries do with the issue of drugs because the Americans no longer have the sort of moral right to tell us what to do. So back to a bit of science, since uh, some of you are neuroscientists. What is a drug? And, and perhaps more importantly, who should say what a drug is? It may seem a strange question, but for those of you who are uh, aspiring pharmacologists, this is the 
definition of a drug, something which when given to a rat results in a scientific paper. And, uh, UCL, is, like other, other universities with pharmacy departments and pharmacology departments, truly believe that. The drinks industry takes a different view. The drinks industry essentially tries to make the distinction between alcohol and other drugs. And it does it like this. And, and this, to a scientist, is so absurd, it, it's laughable. But to the rest of the world, it's obvious. And if you try talking to your parents, or your, you know, just your parents, I think you've got kids, have you? Talk to your parents when you have them and say, is alcohol a drug? And they'll look at you and they'll say, well, of course not. And you say, well, but if it, you drink it to make your brain feel different, and if you drink too much, you might fall over and have a hangover the next day, surely it must be a drug. And they'll look at you as if you're on something, and, um, <laughs> and they'll say, well, look, if it was a drug, it would be illegal. And that, the circularity of that argument is pervasive. And it's fueled by the drinks industry working desperately behind the scenes, lobbying powerfully to persuade politicians that not only is alcohol not a drug, it's also a great source of income to the country, and if they're very good to them and vote in the right way, they'll be a good source of income to politicians too. This is my definition of what a drug is, something a politician once used but now regrets. <laughs> So you can see why they got irritated with me, can't you? Um, and um, Jackie Smith, who was a Home Secretary, had a big argument with over the classification of ecstasy. When she became Home Secretary, she was asked a standard question, have you ever taken drugs? And instead of telling the truth, which was, well, I do drink Chablis, but only half a bottle a night, <laughs> she said, I use cannabis, but I didn't enjoy. There are two paradoxes in that statement. The first is, why would you bother? And the answer was, I think, that was what you had to do to get into the Labour Party in Oxford at the time. <laughs> and the second was, not enjoying a drug is no defence in law. And as the Home Secretary, she should have known that. <laughs> and then, of course, there's David Cameron, uh, who famously avoided the question by saying, I did things when young that I shouldn't have. We all did. Now that's called the eaten we. <laughs> Otherwise known as the Tory front bench. And the great thing about David, uh, being a conservative, he only did things that began, only did drugs that began with the same letter as the conservative party. <laughs> so we've got cannabis, We've got cocaine. We're not sure about the others, but you can think of those. Um, and that's a problem. Because he got away with it too, and that's why he's Prime Minister. But if he'd been caught, he wouldn't be Prime Minister. And the arbitrariness of that is really quite telling. And I'll come on to that when we get on to thinking about cannabis a little later. So this is why I would say a drug is a chemical which, when taken, produces physiological changes in the body. And in the context of what we're discussing tonight, these are changes in the brain which usually are pleasurable, but which can turn out to be discomforting, like withdrawal, or can turn out to lead to dependence and addiction, or in some cases can actually kill you. And here are deaths from drugs. Here are two people that died from taking drugs. On the left-hand side, a man called Gavin Britton, a student from Exeter University, in the golf team, played a, a golf match with another university, and then engaged in a drinking game afterwards. He lost the first round, and the forfeit was to drink. So he then lost the second round, and the forfeit was to drink more. And by the end of the third round, he was dead of alcohol poisoning. A stupid, stupid game that many, unfortunately, far too many sports people engage in, uh, in universities and other circumstances. On the right, a woman called Leah Betts. Now, how many of you have heard of Leah Betts? Yeah. And you've heard of Leah Betts because she's famous, because that's a billboard, that's an advertising hoarding. And, and, and her face was plastered all over the country on these hoardings with the, type, the, the, the image of her face and the word sorted. And the sorting was a word that was used at the time for people being adequately supplied with their MDMA in a rave. If you had it at a couple of tabs, you were sorted. 
And the reason you've all heard of her is because she was made famous, because she died soon after her 18th birthday as a consequence of taking two ecstasy tablets, which we estimate to about to be about 80 milligrams, which is exactly the dose we used in the Channel 4 programme, I'll tell you about in a minute. But no one died in the Channel 4 programme, but she died. And the reason she died was because she didn't understand the health message or the harm reduction method messages around MDMA. And when she started to feel her heart beating faster, she started to drink water. And she drank seven litres of water in the course of an afternoon of just organising a house for her 18th birthday party. And she died of water poisoning. Gavin died of alcohol poisoning, like about three young people a week do in this country. But you don't know about Gavin because alcohol deaths are so common, they don't really get reported in the newspapers. But ecstasy deaths are so rare that they do get reported. But this particular death got reported massively because at that time the drinks industry was terrified that young people would stop taking alcohol and would switch to MDMA. So they started a campaign which was run to this day to scare people away from other drugs than alcohol by magnifying the harms of those drugs and minimizing the harms of alcohol. In fact, the only person you probably ever heard of who actually did die of alcohol poisoning was Amy. Now, when she died, I assumed she had taken at least something else than alcohol, probably a cocktail of drugs. But no, she just simply died of drinking a liter of vodka. And the sadness of that is that she was supposedly cured. Our current government says that if you're clean or dry for six weeks, you're cured of your addiction. Absurd statement, because addiction in most cases is a lifelong vulnerability. But she was supposedly recovered. And like many addicts who relapsed from recovery, she went back to using the same quantity of drugs she used before, which in this case killed her. It wouldn't have killed her when she was tolerant, but because she lost tolerance during recovery, she died. And this policy, by the way, of uh, rewarding treatments, uh, treatment agencies only when they get people clean from drugs like heroin, is leading to a massive increase in deaths in this country from heroin overdoses as people relapse. Utterly predictable, been seen many times in other countries which have pursued simplistic abstinence-based policies, but now we're reaping the benefit in the face of being told repeatedly that this was going to happen. So there's poor old Amy. What, what did we do about her death? Did we use her death to warn people about the harms of alcohol? No. There's no billboard saying, don't drink a litre of vodka, because the drinks industry won't pay for them, and nor will the government. If we're interested in drug harms, we, need, we can look at some of the hard metric, which is deaths. And this graph shows the deaths from uh, smoking, about 80,000 largely middle-aged to older people. Alcohol, about 20,000 a year. And then much smaller numbers, opiates, about 1,200, paracetamol, 200. Amphetamines, cannabis, ecstasy, methadone, vanishingly small. And the reason I got sacked was for arguing that the, the hysteria that the media and the, and the government uh, maintain around drugs like cannabis and methadone and MDMA is a deliberate smokescreen to pretend to the country they're doing something and to uh, get them off the hook of doing something about tobacco and alcohol because they don't want to confront those industries with, with their lobbyists and their uh, powerful influence in the media. So it's basically cowardice uh, and a focus on society or people who use drugs like cannabis because they can't really fight back. If you're interested in other preventable deaths, then here you have melanoma killing about 2,000 a year, road traffic accidents about 2,500, suicide about 5,000, AIDS about 400. So alcohol and tobacco are far and away the leading preventable causes of death in this country, and therefore we should be targeting them. And if you look at the harms of drugs, this is a famous paper we produced a few years ago now, ranking the harms of different drugs. You discover in the UK today, and this is also now true in Europe, we've done exactly the same analysis across Europe, that alcohol is the most damaging drug to society. And it's most damaging because of the size of the red bar. And the red bar is the harms of alcohol to society. The blue bars, the size of the blue bars, are the harms of the, each individual drug to the user. So in terms of 
Users, crack cocaine, crystal meth are the most harmful drugs to the users. But alcohol is the most harmful drug in the UK because of the enormous social harm caused by the vast amount of drinking that goes on in this country. And that's, if we care about the harms of drugs, if we try to make policies to reduce the harms of drugs, we have to target alcohol. So why is alcohol the most harmful drug? Well, I, I haven't got time to go through it all, but I'll just show you a couple of things. The first is, it's the one drug we know that really does damage the brain. Every week I get some journalists saying, here's another paper showing that cannabis damages the brain. And I read it and I say, well, it might do, it might not. But the one thing for sure, we've known for 200 years, is that alcohol damages the brain. These are brain images, brain scans of four of my patients. Here are four age and sex match controls. And you don't have to be a radiologist or a doctor to see that these brains are not the same as these brains. These brains have got shrunken cortex. They've got large uh, spaces, the ventricles are expanded full of water. <coughs> these brains are damaged by alcohol. These brains are as damaged as people with Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I think alcohol is probably the leading preventable cause of dementia in this country. Because these people have got so much brain damage, they're very likely to move on to be uh, demented. And these people are in a trial we're doing, trying to find treatments to stop them relaxing. They've all succeeded in stopping drinking but we don't want them to go down the same path as Amy Winehouse. So we're trying to find treatments to stop people relaxing. There are none in this country, virtually none at present. It's an area that has hardly been researched at all. And then there's this statistic, and this is a chilling statistic because I see a, almost all of you in the room are under, under the age of 50. And alcohol now is the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50 in this country. And the way women are drinking, alcohol will be the leading cause of drinking women, probably by the end of this decade. So this is a chilling statistic. Uh, a number of you in this room will die of an alcohol-related uh, death uh, before you're 50. And if you want evidence that this is deliberate uh, avoidance of confronting the problem, here you have it. So when I started in medicine in 1969, I went to medical school, they started collecting data on the likelihood of people in this country dying from particular disorders. And they standardized them uh, to 100 at this point. And you can see over the course of my medical career that deaths from respiratory disease, diabetes, endocrine diseases have all fallen. They've fallen to, in some cases, a third of what they were in 1970. And that is because society is healthier and medicine is better. That's what you'd expect. So isn't it strange that deaths from liver disease have gone up five times, whilst deaths from heart disease have gone down to a third? And this massive rise in liver deaths is almost all due to alcohol. And we saw it happening. The point collecting these data is so that you can see what's happening in the health service. And we knew within five years that there was something worrying happening in relation to liver deaths. But we did nothing. In fact, what we did here was liberalise drinking, allow drinks companies to start selling alcohol pops and super strength lagers to increase the death rate from alcohol. So we have seen it happening. We've turned a blind eye for 40 years. And Again, by the end of um, this decade, liver disease will overtake heart disease as a leading cause of death in men under the age of 65. And that's almost all driven by alcohol. So let's contrast that with cannabis. This has been a political uh, whipping boy for decades now. There's the Home Secretary who actually sacked me, there's Alan Johnson. There's me, you can see my moustache in there. <laughs> <laughs> And this government has been, been particularly uh, hard on cannabis, as was the government before it. So why is that? Well, what's strange is that cannabis is illegal at all. And what's even more disturbing is that it's, no, hasn't, it's not a medicine. So cannabis is probably the oldest medicine in the world. Uh, it was much beloved by Queen Victoria. She, used it for period pains, she used it for the pains of childbirth, 
And when I'm feeling more, more bit mischievous, I sometimes wonder if she had so many children because she's using it in moral as well, other times. <laughs> In 1971, it was banned as a medicine. It was banned because two doctors were prescribing it and recommending people smoke it rather than take it as a tincture. And for political reasons, the government then banned the drug as a medicine uh, rather than just banning the doctors because they wanted to make a point. Well, that truth is actually they didn't really want to make a point. They just wanted to do what America was telling them to do, which they didn't. And now we've denied medical cannabis to, to our country for 40 years. The purpose of banning cannabis was to try to stop people using it. Well, you can see that that didn't work. Here you see when it was made illegal as a medicine in 1971, about half a million people had ever used it. The latest data we had is about 12 million people. So you've got a 20 times increase in consumption despite it being taken off the formula in hand, being <coughs> illegal. Now, those, that five-fold increase in liver deaths I showed you, has occurred in the face of a doubling of alcohol consumption. Now you might imagine, therefore, if there was a 20-fold increase in the number of users of cannabis, that probably equates to even greater increase in consumption. So there might be some serious harms from cannabis that would have emerged since 1970. You might imagine that. Well, I showed you there's no deaths. So that's a problem. People don't die of cannabis, so why else can you justify making it illegal? And that's been a challenge, and governments have tried to get around that for some time. As I've said, the reason we made it illegal uh, and, and pursued the illegality is because the Americans wanted us to. And we've done it with a vigor that they would be proud of. And we've tried to justify it because of skunk, because of driving risk, and because of schizophrenia risk. And I'm just going to take each of those apart in turn. So skunk has been a really convenient uh, weapon of misinformation that governments have used around cannabis. We've seen claims like this. We've seen the president of the, the World College of GPs say skunk is a hundred times more potent than the hash. We've seen a supposed neuroscientist from another university, not this one, say that one spliff kills a million neurons in the hippocampus. Ridiculous. And we've seen other leading, supposedly leading psychiatrists say that cannabis is a leading cause of schizophrenia. And we've seen our Prime Minister saying, skunk is lethal. Are there any Scots people in the audience? I, I've never been quite sure whether lethal is a Scottish word for a good or Because <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not an English word that makes sense in relation to skunk. The reality of skunk is this. That skunk is to hash or resin or what wine is to beer. And it's as ridiculous being concerned about skunk as it is being concerned about the middle classes switching from beer to wine. There is perhaps another angle to this, that in, in encouraging the production of high THC skunk, the plants have lost this substance called cannabidiol, which is a potentially protective agent that occurs alongside THC in <coughs> typical traditional cannabis plants. But well, the other thing is that, by and large, people who smoke THC, whether it's skunk or hash, to get stoned, they know when they're stoned, and they usually stop when they are stoned. So the skunk story was just a scare story that really hasn't really been convincingly shown to be uh, a serious problem. And then we got the driving issue. Well, people are going to drive stoned. Well, this is interesting because this is the government's own report last year, which showed that Uh, having cannabis on board increases your risk of a road traffic accident by twice. Having alcohol on board increases it eight times, and the two together increase it by about uh, 14 times. So cannabis is considerably less uh, problematic for driving than alcohol. We know that because most people who are stoned don't want to drive, and if they do drive, they drive more carefully because it doesn't disinhibit people, it doesn't make them think that they're Schumachers. <laughs> and then there's schizophrenia, this, this fear that schizophrenia is caused by cannabis. Well, you know, if that were true, it would be very important 
Uh, so we look carefully using the government's the MRC's own database of looking at the prevalence and the incidence of psychosis, the prevalence and incidence of schizophrenia over the time course where that massive increase, that 20-fold increase in cannabis use would be predicted to have produced schizophrenia. And we found no change. If anything, the rate of schizophrenia declining slightly. And this is not just true in this country, this is true in all the Western world where you have seen similar massive increases in cannabis use. So cannabis does not cause schizophrenia. It might cause a small fraction of schizophrenia in some people who use it at a very early age. If you believe that data, which uh, perhaps is reasonable to believe, then we estimated you've got to stop 5,000 young men or 7,000 women from ever smoking cannabis to stop one case of schizophrenia. Now that is a, not in any sense, in any world, a practical public health target. And it's not a target to achieve through criminalizing people who use cannabis. What did the government do? Well, we pointed it out to them that, that cannabis as class C was a, 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 the right place for cannabis to be. It wasn't a harmful drug. And they, because they were argue, trying to get re-elected, the Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, said this, my decision to reclassify cannabis from, B, from C to B was based on issues such as public perception, policing priorities. When there's doubt about potential harm that will be caused, I must err on the side of caution and protect the public. So when I said to her, well, actually, one thing's for sure, Alcohol really is causing harm, there's no doubt about that. Why don't you do something about it if you're seriously concerned about reducing harm and protecting the public? There was no reply. And that's because she, like her boss at the time, Gordon Brown, were trying to use cannabis as a political tool. And this is what happened, this is actually what happened. And bear this in mind when you're thinking about who you're going to vote for in this election. So this is, this is how British politics works and how drug laws are made. Gordon Brown was terrified he was going to lose the last election, so he tried to get support from the most remarkable source called the Daily Mail, the most right-wing paper in Britain. And he had an off-the-record off the record lunch with Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, and asked if the Mail would support the Labour Party in the last election. And Dacre said, yes, he would support the Labour Party. They did three things. Reclassify cannabis, reduce the income tax to 45%, and become much harder on immigration. And that's why Gordon Brown started sounding off about skunk being lethal, because he was trying to show the Daily Mail that he was doing their bidding. Now, that's a, that's a, <clears throat> I think that for that to have happened at all is an insult to the British people who elected him or at least elected the Labour Party. And of course, what an error of judgment. Did, did the Daily Mail support Labour in the last election? Did they help? No. So they reneged on their promises, even though we reclassified cannabis. Now, we have now a million young people in this country, maybe some of you in the audience, who have got criminal records for possessing cannabis. It costs half a billion pounds a year to process those convictions causes enormous destruction to the lives of the people who get the convictions because they become an underclass. They, they cannot get jobs in teaching, civil service, the police, the armed forces, etc. And we've done that simply in order to try to gather and garnish a few votes from the right-wing press. It's outrageous. This is, a, this is one of the most disgusting examples of bad laws that have ever been made. And this is part of a terrible process which permeates decision-making in this country, how the media and politicians collude in distorting the evidence. This is a wonderful PhD done by uh, Alastair Forsyth in Scotland. He looked at every death reported by coroners in Scotland in the 1990s, and then looked at all the ones in which a drug other than alcohol was present at the time of death. And he discovered there were 2,255 deaths in those 10 years. 
They went through all the newspapers, and he discovered that 546 of them were reported in newspapers. And what was interesting about these reports, if you died of paracetamol, you didn't get in the newspaper. If you died of diazepam, if you died of morphine, you didn't get in the newspaper. If you died of amphetamine, there were very few, you were much more likely to get in Cocaine, only one in eight deaths were reported. Methadone, heroin, one in five, but the death that was always reported was ecstasy. So although there were only 28 deaths, so that's about three a year, they all got reported in the Scottish papers. And that is why people who read those papers think that ecstasy is really dangerous, because that's all they read about. And of course, that's what the newspapers want you to think, because that's what the drinks is. That was then, it goes on. Here's one of the greatest headlines in history. Legal drug teen ripped his throat off in the sun. This is referring to methadrone. Yeah, it is laughable, isn't it? Yeah. We wrote to them and said, um, this is a really important side effect. We'd like to understand it. Could you put us in touch with this boy? And they said, no, we couldn't because we don't know who he is. And we said, would you actually know this happened? And they said, oh no, someone told us. <laughs> Which means someone made it up. And it's kind of worrying that the front page of a very popular newspaper can be completely invented. And here's another example. This is a, a slightly more subtle, but very disturbing collusion between the police and the media. And I'll just tell you the story, because it's, a, it's, a, <coughs> it's, it's really sort of blazed into my memory. I was a... I was in Barcelona, I was going to give a lecture, and uh, I got a phone call from CNN, and I'd done an interview on Methadrama with them a couple of days before, and they said, where's Scunthorpe? <laughs> now that's not a question you get asked very often. Um, and I said, why do you want to go to Scunthorpe? And they said, because the Humberside police have called an international press conference to tell the world that two young men have died from taking Methadrama, meow meow. I said, well, that's impossible because you know, half a million, pretty much, Israelis have been using it for the last two years and then not a single death. It's inconceivable there are going to be two deaths in one night in Scunthorpe. However, if you really want to go to the press conference, drive up the M1 for four hours and turn right. And, uh, <laughs> now, I don't know if they made it, but if they had, they would have heard this. They would have heard the police encouraging this boy's dad, Nick's dad, weeping and telling youngsters to avoid the drug. Because they thought, the officers believed that these boys had taken methadrone. And what Nick's dad said, I don't want him to be labelled a druggie because he wasn't. He was just on a night out with friends enjoying himself, a normal, caring, hard-working lad. Now, everything in that statement in red is correct except for one word. And to make it easy for you, it's in bold. Because he was a druggie. He was an alcohol druggie. He'd been out drinking in about six bars for about eight hours on a Sunday night. And he was so drunk, as was his mate, that they went into town and they took methadone, the opiate substitute for heroin. And they died, as many people do, combining alcohol with methadone. And they died because alcohol impaired their judgment so much they didn't know what they were doing or didn't care what they were doing. The police had no reason whatsoever to suspect that Nefedron was involved in camp. But how else are you going to get CNN to stand for? <laughs> and this is the way it goes. And we, ha we have seen in the last hundred years zero progression in terms of the intellectual debate around drugs that comes out of government. Here we have Gordon Brown saying we've got to prevent this evil of Nefedron killing our young people. And a hundred years ago we had the head of the Metropolitan Police saying, we've got to stop the evil of cocaine. Now, we pay a lot of taxes to allow the government to employ intelligent people to hopefully make good laws. And when all they do is recycle this kind of rhetoric, which is 100 years old, knowing full well that drugs don't have a valence, drugs aren't evil, we, and, and I think it's insulting to you as and to me, as, as people who actually can think about this, that we just get rubbish rhetoric rather than proper answers. One of the interesting things about methadrone was that it had a huge impact on the drug scene in Britain in a completely unpredicted way. It reduced cocaine deaths. Here's this rising tide of cocaine deaths which have gone up 
All those 10 years I was working for the government trying to stop this, I was failing. If you sat me for this, I would have accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then methadone enters the scene, a free market, a safe drug, which is almost impossible to kill yourself with. If you take a, a bag of methadone, a gram of methadone won't kill you. Look, 40 deaths fewer from cocaine the year after methadone comes, comes in, and halving of the deaths from amphetamine. <coughs> Methadrone saved many more lives than it killed. Whether it killed anyone, I don't know. But it certainly saved probably 60 to 80 lives from other stimulants. As you'd predict, because it's a relatively mild, relatively safe stimulant. And as it's been banned, we've now seen the corner things turning. So we're going back to rising deaths from the older, traditional, more toxic stimulants. And we're also seeing this very worrying trend that some of you were no, I've been banging on about in the last couple of weeks. It's going to be a, on Five Live at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, another debate about this. This rise of PMA and PMMA deaths. Now, these, these deaths are utterly avoidable. No one takes PMA willingly. They take it because they think it's ecstasy or MDMA. And they then die as a consequence. <coughs> this, is, this is a direct consequence of our drug policy. The prohib prohibitory policy around MDMA and the precursors has led to PMA becoming the drug. Here are the two drugs. Here's MDMA, here's PMA. They structurally look pretty similar. They've got nitrogens, they've got oxygens off the phenol group. They're not dissimilar drugs at all. MDMA is made from a precursor called safrol. Safrol comes from sassafras oil, and the majority source of sassafras oil in the last decade has been from plants, tropical plants in places like Thailand and Cambodia. In 1998, the production and sale of saffron was banned and not much happened until 2008, when there was a massive seizure of about 50 tonnes of saffron in Thailand. And the WHO claimed a massive success, we're going to wipe out the MDMA market because we've taken away the precursor. Well, one of the things people need to understand is that these underground chemists who are making MDMA, they don't say, fair cop, you've got my precursor, I'll stop. <laughs> what they say is, what looks like saffron? Ah, aniseed oil, yes, I'll use that. And what happens when you use aniseed oil, you get PMA or PMMA. So these drugs have been invented as a direct consequence of the ban of saffron. We've made much more toxic compounds. They're now being sold as these Superman pills which killed three people over Christmas. They're not stimulants. No one in their right minds would use PMAs because it isn't a stimulant. We've known that since Shulgin tested it on himself back in the 50s. It has a slow onset of action, so people, do, people think they've got a bum deal of MDMA and they take another dose, so they overdose, that's called stacking. What it does do is it blocks monoamine oxidase, so it prevents the breakdown of the, of the, end of the hormones which are released when you do take a big dose, when the serotonin levels rise and the dopamine levels rise. So this drug is a toxic drug which kills people, and it only exists because we have tried to stop people getting MDMA by stopping its production. It's a classic example of prohibition leading to greater problems. And one of the other aspects of the drug laws is not that they don't work, but they may cause more harm uh, than they, uh, they uh, kill more people than they they say, but they have another profoundly damaging influence on society, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So this shows that there is no correlation whatsoever between the harms of drugs and the position of uh, drugs uh, in the Misuse of Drugs Act. And that tells us, therefore, the law is unjust. We're putting people in prison, or prosecuting them for using drugs which are less harmful than drugs they can buy uh, in supermarkets like alcohol. So it's unjust, it's ineffective, and it massively, massively impedes research. And this is something I've only become aware of in the last five, six years as I started to work in this field. Now, if you want to read more about the background, read this article. It's freely available, I think, from Nature Reviews, Neuroscience. And it goes through the, the history of why drugs are controlled and the, the lost opportunities. Uh, but I'm just going to talk you briefly through some of the key points here. So this is proof that making a drug illegal really does mess with research. So psilocybin is the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. 
1958, it was in, the structure was identified by Hoffman, the guy that discovered LSD. So here you have the structure identified. You have a massive amount of research going on in the next 10 years trying to understand why it's psychedelic. Then it's made illegal here. And you can see how there's a tr dramatic reduction in the research output. So this is prohibition stopping research. Fact. <coughs> Such prohibition would have horrified some of the greatest scientists of the last century. These are the two most important Nobel Prize winners in medicine and physiology ever. This is the guy that discovered the double helix. This is the guy that discovered how to measure the double helix. This is the guy, Harry Mullins' technique of PCR. He's the man that allows you to know whether there's horse meat in your cow burger. Because the PCR has transformed everything we do in the life sciences. Kerry Mullins saw the PCR reaction as he was taking an LSD trip and driving down the San Diego Highway. He saw DNA unraveling in front of him. And he was a great protagonist for the use of LSD um, as a way of improving insights into scientific problems. Francis Crick, having achieved one of the greatest discoveries in, of humankind, the, how DNA was, uh, uh, how DNA worked, essentially, how it, was, how it was a double helix, he then thought, I'll, I'll move on to something more challenging. And he, went, he started working on consciousness. And he started taking LSD to help him understand his brain. And then LSD was made illegal. And the police in Cambridge got interested in his parties. And he, he left the country. He, he left Cambridge because he thought he was going to be arrested for, for using LSD to help him understand consciousness. And he moved to Arizona, and he left there for the rest of his life. And that's an example, not only of prohibition stopping research, but also of prohibition driving people out of this country. Both of them would have agreed with Einstein, I think, who said this, that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And certainly, you know, I wonder in some of my more whimsical moments whether if more physicists had taken psychedelics, the, the Higgs boson would have come out from a hiding of its sinner, I don't know. <laughs> it's possible. What many people don't realize is that LSD was a medicine. When it was discovered, its, its potential for medical breakthroughs was seen, and Sandler made it freely available that it was a sort of non-profit um, production of this medicine called Delicid. And in the 1950s and 60s, there were a thousand clinical papers on LSD, 40,000 patients were studied, 40 books, six conferences, and the results were overwhelmingly positive, describing safe and effective treatments. And here's an example. This is a recent meta-analysis of six of the original LSD trials in alcoholism. And they show an effect size, the ability to keep people abstinent from alcoholism, the Amy Winehouse problem, <coughs> as big as anything we have today. But for the last 50 years, no one's been allowed to use this drug to treat alcoholism. Since LSD was banned, there has only been one clinical study in 50 years that was published just last year for people with terminal illness. And there have been two science, neuroscience studies, one of ours and another one from Switzerland, both published at the end of last year. So in 50 years, we've gone from to almost no research, having in the previous decade had over a thousand papers. That is appalling censorship. So the question is, why did we ban LSD? And the truth is, it was, it was bad because it was encouraging people to stop fighting. America was fighting the Vietnam War. Young Americans were going to San Francisco, taking LSD and thinking, no, I don't really want to go and shoot Viet Cong in the jungle and get shot myself. I think I'll just put flowers in my hair and enjoy myself. And this is the statement. This is the, this is the statement that really scared them. The idea that people could drop acid and not bombs was so anathema to the American way of doing life, the militaristic view of the world and the way America had to control the world through its military power, that they had to get the drug found. And so they invented stories. They invented stories that made the sun look tame. 
You're all these birth girls. LSD fed a rapes TV actor. Now everyone knew this, these were lies. Everyone knew this was utterly ridiculous. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if there's enough noise, then politicians say, well, we're acting on the noise. There's a public perception, even if it's not true, so we have to do something about it. So they banned it. They banned it, though, in the face of opposition for the most powerful man in America at the time. This is Bobby Kennedy, who would have been president if he hadn't been shot. So here we have the regulators and the military banning this drug. And here's Bobby Kennedy saying to me, why, if the trials were worthwhile six months ago, why aren't they worthwhile now? We keep going around and around. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding about my question? So you've got lots of useful trials, suddenly, oh no, we can't study this drug anymore. I think people, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society, if used properly. So this, the drug was banned even though he, the main senior politicians didn't want it banned, because the military wanted it banned, and the Drug Enforcement Agency wanted it banned. And I think, and I'll ask you this question, has there ever been a worse example of research censorship? Well, the truth is, in neuroscience, the answer is no. But there has been possibly one other example of worse, science, of worse censorship in science. And that's this one. That is the banning of the telescope by the Catholic Church in 1616. <laughs> they, they banned the writings of Copernicus for 150 years. We've banned work on psychedelics and other related drugs like MDMA for 50 years and counting. The expansion of scientific knowledge in the last 50 years will be thousands of fold greater than the expansion of knowledge in those 150 years. So you can argue that this is even worse censorship. And it has based on no sensible evidence at all. It's all scare I put in the Enlightenment in my talk because it was the Enlightenment which eventually overturn the role that the Catholic Church had on the way we did science in the West. And these are some of the pillars of the Enlightenment, but the one I take particular, have particular affection for is Voltaire, who coined many great phrases, including this one. Prejudices are what fools use for reason, and that is exactly, exactly how the drug laws in this country are maintained today, through prejudice, by fools. <laughs> Many bad drugs were treatments and, and they have enormous potentials to become new treatments. Cannabis for pain, sleep, spasticity, cancer, PTSD, ecstasy for PTSD, Parkinson's disease, psilocybin for depression, OCD, cluster headaches, LSD for terminal illness, addiction. Methadrone was being developed as a, an addiction treatment. It worked. It reduced cocaine deaths. But no one will now use it as a medicine because it's illegal. The regulations make it almost impossible. Only four hospitals in the whole country have a license to hold cannabis. You have, a, have to have a special license to store cannabis. Any hospital, pharmacy, doctor can hold heroin. But cannabis is treated as more dangerous than heroin. Utterly good to see it. So let me tell you a bit about our own work because we've been trying to rectify this appalling censorship of research. And I've done it in collaboration with the Beckley Foundation, a charity interested in this field, and we've done studies on psilocybin, we've done some beginning to work on LSD, we've worked on MDMA, and we're planning to do an MDMA treatment trial on PTSD. Let me just show you how one group can, can give you, working with these substances, to show such a, an enormous richness of research outcomes that I think it will make you sad that so little has been done over these years. We decided to start with psilocybin, magic mushrooms. They're not as potent as LSD. They're on this, they're one of these many psychedelic drugs. They all fall on this line. This is the line of affinity at the 5AC2 receptor. We used intravenous psilocybin. Truth is, we used it because we couldn't afford oral psilocybin because the illegal status makes these drugs so expensive because there's so many regulations 
to, you have to pay to get through. So we used intravenous psilocybin and we thought, let's see what happens to people given this drug in a scanner. We know that the drugs work on these 5-HT2A receptors. Here's a scan showing the high density of these receptors in the cortex, uh, in the singular cortex. Isn't it? These receptors for psilocybin have evolved enormously as the human brain has evolved. They're in extremely important parts of the human brain, and therefore it's a great interest to neuroscientists to know what they're doing. You can only find out what they're doing, really, by stimulating them with psilocybin. We actually know that they're on these neurons, the layer 5. This is just for the neuroscientists in the audience, just very quickly. These pyramidal cells in layer 5 have got a high density of these receptors. And they're also on interneurons which regulate them. So there's a little gating part of the cortex where the 5 ac 2 a receptor is particularly expressed. And it seems obviously has an important role. So what do we find? Well, to our amazement, we did this twice because we were so amazed the first time. We discovered that despite the fact that people are lying in a scanner and they're seeing all sorts of interesting colours floating through their eyes, they're thinking, feeling extremely strange, they're floating through space, the brain was shut off. It didn't turn on at all. In fact, we discovered that three areas of the brain were significantly dampened down following side of side in the posterior singlet, the anterior singlet, and the thalamus. Completely unpredictable. So that's a first major finding. You do an experiment, you get the opposite result. It's going to be true. And you can see here, here's a reductions in blood flow in those three regions under psilocybin compared with psilocybin. And the more, the greater the reduction in activity in the brain, the greater the uh, psychological changes. <coughs> so what's going on? Well, we went back to the emerging literature on brain circuits and looking at this, this concept of there being multiple nodes in the brain. And it turns out that the areas of the brain we're finding are switched off by psilocybin are, is this region here, the posterior node, and this region, the anterior node. And those are the parts of the brain which integrate brain function. And they're critical for the other parts of the brain talking to each other. So what we think is happening is that psilocybin is switching off those nodes. It also, we can show it in a different way. What you see here are, are maps of statistical uh, activity that is congruent with this part of the brain, the anterior cingulate, or discongruent. And what you see here, when the front part of the brain, the anterior cingulate, is active, so is the posterior cingulate. And these, these two parts of the brain work in unison, and they're called the default mode network. And that's the part of the brain which is you. When you're sitting there reflecting on what you're going to do tonight, or what you did yesterday, or why you made such a mess of your relationship last night, etc. That's the default mode. This is, your, this is really where your ego is situated. The other parts of the brain, like your, your motor cortex, are completely separate. So when you're active in thinking, these two parts of the brain are, are working together. Under psilocybin, they become disconnected. In fact, they become almost anti-correlated. So we switch off the part of the brain, which is the core of you. And that's why people get strange experiences. And one of the most remarkable books in history is this book by Aldous Huxley called The Doors of Perception, when he describes in 1953 taking mescaline, peyote. And uh, his view as to what the psychedelics were doing is quoted here. In, in doing so, mescaline lowers the efficiency of the brain as an instrument of focusing the mind. And that is exactly right. Because basically what your brain does is orchestrate what you think. And if you can dampen down those control centers that make you think what you've always thought, your brain can actually do other things and see different things and perhaps understand things differently. So this is, a, this is a very interesting insight into the way in which brains actually are not open-minded, to coin a phrase. They're actually constraining you to what you do. And here is a beautiful image. One of the powerful things about these data sets is we can make them available to mathematicians. Here's a group from King's who've worked on our data set, and they've looked at connectivity in the brain normally and in the side of side. And the psilocybin brain is much more connected. Bits of the brain which don't normally connect to each other 
are talking to each other. And this is this is the sort of opening up of brain function through in a diff very different way. So that, I think it's a beautiful image of just exactly what a psychedelic does. Like it, it really does allow the brain to interconnect more than it would normally do, by like turning off the control centers. An interesting thing about doing this research is that there was enormous cynicism by referees. Here's some examples of their comments. Well, these drugs just change blood flow because they're actually drugs to use in migraine, or light drugs in migraine. This is a wonderful. What do you expect if you mess up the brain with psychedelics? That's what, and this is a great quote, another quote from Huxley, and I recommend you read at least The Doors of Perception. Orthodoxy is the die-hard of the world of thought. It learns not, neither can it forget. And as scientists, we have to challenge orthodoxy. Just like Copernicus challenged the orthodoxy of the Catholic Church, we've got to challenge the orthodoxy of our state, which has uh, been so uh, corrosive in terms of this kind of brain science research. Anyway, we said, well, we're going to prove it's not just blood flow. We're going to measure electrical activity in the brain. We went to Cardiff, where they have a MEG set up, which only measures electrical activity. <coughs> and here we found exactly the same thing. We found two regions of the brain, posterior cingulate and anterior cingulate, profoundly affected in terms of the frequency characteristics of their activity. Psilocybin dampens down the activity in these regions. Not everywhere, but in these core regions. The posterior cingulate is a particularly interesting region in terms of people's understanding of where they are in space and time. And the greater you, people scored on this measure of ego disintegration, the greater the dampening down of baseline uh, rhythmic, alpha rhythmic activity in the parietal cortex. I'm working with the, the team at UCL. Anyone from, anyone from the functional Im imaging lab here? Anyone from the film? Oh, no, I suppose you know it all, don't you? Yeah. Anyway, just to give credit for credit to you, Paul Friston and his colleagues at uh, the, the, the Phil here helped us with looking at the MEG data. Using, basically, we use this data to test a theory that the cortex has microcircuits with two parameter cells, two interneurons, and we were able to show that the predominant effect of psilocybin is on these pyramidal cells on layer 5. So this is exactly where the receptors are. This is the first time anyone has shown in human brain a drug effect on a set of neurons. I think this is a unique finding. Uh, this, these drugs change the firing of these neurons because that's where the receptors are. Another mathematical group went away and looked at it looking at using statistical measures of uncertainty, variability. And they showed profound changes in variability in the hippocampus following psilocybin. And they came up with a, another way of looking at what's going on. And this is looking at uh, basal circuits. In the normal brain, in your brain now, these are the five most common circuits. For instance, the hippocampus to anterior cingulate cortex, the left and right hippocampus working together. Under psilocybin, the, those common circuits were different. But what was really interesting is that under psilocybin, a whole new set of circuits emerged. Circuits which didn't normally exist. And that's why people can see things differently under psychedelics. Because their brain works in different ways. It connects different parts. And one of the ways I'm trying to conceptualize this simply for, for the general public is that what we see now are that there are two ways in which we can change brain function. We can change the arousal system, which is the glutamate activating GABA calming system. If we change that, we can go from arousal and alertness down to sedation and amnesia. So this system is a kind of an awareness system. And this system here, the 5-HT2A system, is a completely different system. It's a system which is about thinking, about meaning, about emotion, rather than just whether you're awake or asleep. And this, these are fundamentally different. People under the effect of LSD or psilocybin can remember everything that's going on. There's no impairment of consciousness in this sense. People under drugs like alcohol or ketamine have significant impairments in memory. But then also something fascinating emerged from this research, which meshed with other research being done in John Hopkins. The fact that after giving, being 
Ibn Salasaibin, even in the strange environment of sitting your head in a washing machine, which we call a PET scanner. You can have changes in mood and well-being. And this particular study from Griffith showed that people given psilocybin psychotherapy have reported it as being one of the five most uh, significant meaningful experiences of their life. And some of our subjects found it very meaningful. Now the reason for this, we think, relates to the nature of depression and the nature in which people's mood is regulated by their brain. Here's a study looking at this default mode, the anterior-posterior connectivity I showed you, in normal controls and in depressed people. And you see there's greater connectivity in depressed people than the normal controls. So what we think is that in depression now, people get locked into negative, ruminative ways of thinking because their internal default mode, their, their ego, becomes over-connected. They cannot disengage from negative thoughts, feelings of guilt, etc. What drives this? Well, what drives this is this part of the brain here, called the subgenual cingulate. So this drives this. And there's a strong correlation between activity in this part of the brain, and that's now, we can almost call that the depression center. That's the part of the brain which is overactive in depression, and it makes the rest of the default mode overactive. Amazingly, again, you know, you never predicted this, but we found it. Psilocybin dampens down this center for driving depression. So we thought, well, this is really important. Some of our volunteers felt good for weeks. Let's see if we can use it to treat depression. If people don't get better from traditional treatments, maybe psilocybin could help them. Well, it was a great idea. It was so good. The referees loved it. We got funding from the MRC to do this study two years ago. It took us a year to get ethics. It took us two years to get the drug supply. We still haven't got it. Because there's almost nowhere in the world where you can get someone to make this drug to fit with the current regulations for clinical trials. And the, co the true cost of working with these drugs is at least 10 times that of working with normal clinical trials. And those are expensive enough. So the regulations, which I'm sure have not stopped a single person eating mushrooms ever, have completely, have made, we've spent almost all our grant money trying to get permission to do this. It's ridiculous and unnecessary, but that's the way the Home Office works. We've also, uh, as some of you will probably know, looked to look at, tried to look at other drugs, and the most, one that's most um, successfully, we know most successfully, is MDMA. Now, um, did any of you see the Channel 4 program? What did you think? Okay. I thought it was interesting, and, um, but I want to tell you the background story, which didn't come out on the night. Because about a year before that program, I was contacted by a company that made the film, and they said, Channel 4 would like you to uh, show people using cocaine live on TV. <laughs> and I said, I thought that's what the BBC did. No, no. Um, <laughs> I said, no, I'm not interested in doing that, that's just a gimmick. I'm not gonna, you know, I know what cocaine does in the brain, there's no science in them. A month later they came back and they said, well, what class A drug would you do? <laughs> and I said, the one I've been trying to do for 10 years, which is MDMA. Impossible to get funding to work with MDMA in this country. So I said, okay, and they said, right, we'll do it. We did the study, I thought it was a great study. We did science. We gave it to a few other people, like Lionel Shriver, to talk about their experience. She thought it was weedy, but anyway. Yeah. And um, we had a chance to show the big brain to people. And I, just as another aside, when I came to work the next day, the receptionist in, in my building said, she said, that was wonderful. I had no idea that the brain looked like this. And, and that was so, you know, what a wonderful thing. People actually, for the first time, realized what a brain looked like, even though it was a bit smaller than that one. I'm interested in M M MDMA because of PTSD. PTSD is the disorder of modern life. More American soldiers have killed themselves than have been killed by the Taliban and by the insurgents, whatever you want to call them, in Iraq. And that is because they're fighting a war which doesn't make sense, 
and they're fighting the enemy they can't see, and a lot of them are being blown up uh, or getting brain injury from explosives that make them vulnerable. Rwanda, 40% of Rwandans have got PTSD, probably over 50% of Syrians have got PTSD. Those kids that are freezing to death in tents on the, the hills, you know, in southern Turkey, they're going to be traumatized for the rest of their lives. PTSD is a horrible disorder, it's hard to treat, and we should be looking for ways of helping people. And one of the most remarkable studies in recent years is this one. This is a group of Mitt Hoffer and his um, team. And they took people who had failed two treatments for PTSD, and they randomized them to uh, a placebo, which was an active placebo, methylphenidate, and to MDMA. And the way it goes is this. They get a session, 125 milligrams of MDMA, in a psychotherapeutic session. And they get better. The ones that get MDMA get better and the ones who get placebo don't. And they stay well. Almost everyone who got better stayed well a year later. Some have been well for four years. So this is potentially a revolution in helping people who have been traumatized. These are people who, through no harm of their own, no, no fault of their own, have just been traumatized. We could help them if they can't be helped by other means. So we did the MDMA study to try to find out why that might be true. And to our amazement, we found, just like with psilocybin, MDMA does not turn on the brain. It, you, it might allow you to dance all night, but it doesn't turn on the brain. It turns off the brain. Blue is less. But it turns off different parts of the brain to psilocybin, which is why it's not psychedelic. It turns off areas of the brain, like the thalamus and the, particularly the amygdala. And we think it works in PTSD because it stops the emotional reaction, which can overwhelm people with PTSD who are going into therapy. And the best therapy for PTSD is to have a re is to re relive the experience, but in a way where you can control the emotion. And we think that this is what it's doing. It's helping down down the emotion so people can work through the psychological aspects of the trauma, the declarative memory, get control of it, and then move on. So yes, the first ever brain imaging study with MDMA funded by a TV program, because no one else was funded. Oh, I should also say, there's another one coming up, March the 3rd, be ready, <laughs> we'll be sending tickets soon. So just a few words about this research, this is a real challenge. I published this paper, you might want to read a couple of years ago, I called it Guerrilla Psychopharmacology, because we cannot get funding for this research from normal sources. We get some from the Beckley, but most of the people who do this research most of the doctors and the scientists and the physicists and the mathematicians do it for free. They do it because they think it's important and if it isn't going to be funded through traditional sources, it's not going to be funded. It's going to be done. And this is the problem. You talk to major funders and they say, ooh, you know, psychedelics, that's a reputational risk. What will happen if the male start to complain that the MRC is funding pure research into MDMA? That's just encouraging you to use it. So we have to get on doing it. And here are the people that have done the work. I, I don't know, is, is Robin in the audience? He was supposed to be here, I don't know if he made it. No. Okay. And Val's not here, but she's the one from UCL that uh, has been really helpful in terms of doing this research. And I just have a little message from her. She can't be here tonight, but she's got a thing for her. Is Natasha here from her group? So they, they do work in addiction. They've got some interesting data on cannabis and skunk and ketamine. And they're going to tell you about it on the 29th of January. So people from UCL want to go along to the Medical Sciences Building. You can hear a bit more about this cutting-edge research and the psychology of those drugs. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the future. Um, because there's a lot still to do. And it's very comforting to see so many young people in the audience, because hopefully some of you will be in the vanguard of doing it. What needs to be done? Well, the first is... We have actually conducted the first brain imaging study of LSD. But what we don't have is money to pay for the scans. So we have taken out a massive loan to do the scans. Because it, and now we're going to set up a crowd, um, a crowdfunding. Is there, are there people from Wallacea here? But outside, on the way out, there'll be a table. If you're interested in being part of this crowdfunding, please go and sign up. What we are going to offer you, if you support us, is we're going to offer you a, the first ever brain image of LSD. And I'm going to sign it. 
so it could become a collector's piece. But this will be, it will become a collector's piece. So uh, we will, this is what we can offer you if you will support this research. We can offer you drugs, obviously, because they're illegal, but, we, but you can have <laughs> the first ever image of what LSD does in the brain. And this is, I think this is going to be, you know, maybe we will put out a couple of thousand, they're going to be collector's items in the future, because I'm almost certain this is going to revolutionize, again, uh, that aspect of consciousness research in neuroscience. The, as I've mentioned, the psilocybin trial, if we can get through the regulations, we will start in March. We're counting, we've got 10 days left. They've got 10 days to say no, so hopefully they won't. And then I want to finish by talking about Arcosynth, because I spent almost all my professional life trying to stop people dying from alcohol. I've tried to stop them drinking, I've tried to stop them poisoning themselves, I've tried to get them to recover from alcoholism, and it's very difficult. And about 10 years ago, I thought, we're never going to win this battle. Alcohol is too complex a drug, and it's got a main metabolite, which is acetaldehyde, which is infinitely toxic. It's the stuff that we preserve dead sheep in, and call it art. Um, you can never get rid of that. Alcohol has to be metabolized to acetaldehyde. So I thought, why don't we go, there? why don't we just find a safe alcohol? Why don't we find an alternative to alcohol? The same way as buprenorphine is an alternative to heroin, electronic cigarettes are an alternative to tobacco. So here you have it. Three and a half million people a year die prematurely from alcohol. If we could find a safe alternative, we could, that would be one of the greatest health advances in the history of medicine. And it's within the grasp of neuroscience. I know what to do. I'm going to show you. So, why? Let's hope we can do it. But the challenge, of course, is getting funding. Because when I talk to rich people and say, invest in this, and they say, well, it's a great idea, Dave. You know, is it legal? I say, of course it's legal. I'm not going to do anything that's illegal. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to be locked up. And they say, OK, um, how can you be sure that the Sun won't write a headline saying, nuts, arco-synth, made me tear my scrotum off? <laughs> And that's kind of an interesting question to which you have to just say, well, let's hope the, hope the Sun journalists have improved a bit in terms of their scientific quality. But you can't be sure. With irrational laws, irrational things can happen. And there's a lot of uncertainty. And I'm, it's great to share with you what we're doing. Because the only, I realize now the only way we can actually make this kind of field develop is by the public wanting it. The government doesn't care at all about idiot scientists like me. They just think I'm too smart for my own boots. But they do care about you. And if enough people like you say, we want this, we don't want to die of alcohol, we don't want my brothers and sisters and our parents rotting their livers of alcohol, we want a safe alternative, they might listen. So there it is. Here's one, Here's one of the number of candidates, which is called MEAA, 3 d thoxyamine similar to alcohol. I mean, relaxing. Socializing, doesn't make you wobble, doesn't make you ataxic, no hangover, and no calories for those of you who care about that. <laughs> now we have 85 compounds like this which we're exploring uh, as alternatives to alcohol. We also got another interesting idea, which is maybe you don't want to switch, maybe you don't want to stop drinking, but maybe you want to control your drink. <laughs> and we come up with this concept of a chaperone. Because these, these uh, substances will not only have some effect to mimic, our, mimic alcohol, we think they may well not regulate how much you drink. So we're interested in, interested in developing them for two alternative strategies. Hopefully, one of them will be of interest to investors, because we need quite a lot of money to make these and test them and, and really roll them out. But my view is that this is the sort of approach that neuroscience should be encouraging. Government should want this, because it costs 30 billion a year to treat alcohol the way we treat it in this country. Every taxpayer pays a thousand pounds a year simply to allow the way we consume alcohol today, which is particularly rough on those of you who are taxpayers who don't drink. Now the good news is that at least we've got cartoonists interested. So here we have the Times saying, new alcohol olive drinks, Professor Nutt would not invent. So this is old alcohol, particularly this one. Cameron's absent for special occasions only, considered too dangerous to drink unless that was with clay. <laughs> See, maybe we should have stuck, we shouldn't have called it a chaperone, we should have, should have called it a collaborator or something, shouldn't we? So 
I'm going to stop now. Um, I've taken you on a, on a long journey uh, through quite a lot of different drugs and a bit of neuroscience, and I hope you found it worthwhile. If you have, try to support us. Sign up to Drug Science. Follow me. Um, follow me on Twitter. And if you can, support our work. And I'll stop and take questions. Thank you very much. so much evidence of the harms that you can get from, uh, from illegal drugs and considering there is a fair, almost a consensus certainly from the NCMD uh, that drugs are so damaging, uh, what other reasons might governments have to choose not to legalise drugs and what non-scientific reasons would be? Yeah, well of course the, that's a great question, yeah, I'm taking it over there. So there are, it's a complex set of answers. The first thing is that politicians are people who've taken drugs and got away with it. And, and, and they think, therefore, they're in a sort of privileged position. They don't really care about the people that haven't. So that there's a sort of bias against, uh, against changing things because the people that would have to change things have got away with the, the way it is in present. But beyond that, there's also this, this terrible historical anomaly which, which really started with the prohibition of alcohol in the 1920s in the States and in Norway and Sweden. And in America, prohibition of alcohol led to massive, massive amounts of organized crime. We call it the Mafia today. And when you say to politicians, well, why are you so keen on prohibition of cannabis or heroin when you don't think the prohibition of alcohol is a good thing? They turn away because they, they know there's a fundamental paradox in the way we deal with drugs on the market. And the history of it is fascinating because organized crime was so enormous that the American state, and there was so much corruption amongst the police, that they had to create a special force, the Drug Enforcement Agency, to deal with criminal availability of alcohol. And when that organization uh, realized that alcohol was going to be illegal again, the head of that organization, Harry Anschlinger, who was the second most powerful man in America to the president, realized that he was going to lose his raison d'etre. His 35,000 army of untouchables was going to disappear back to the police force, and he was going to be a nothing again. And that was terrifying to him because he was, you know, he was a very important man. So he decided he, there had to be something equally as bad as alcohol to occupy his men. So he created the myth of marijuana. And he just invented the idea that marijuana was a dangerous drug 
that Mexicans were using it to, um, to commit crimes, the young white boys were beating up their parents because they were stoned. They created this wonderful story about the harms of cannabis, just like the harms of methadone were created and before that the harms of MDMA. And since then, we've had a policy that there's so much money invested in being hard on drugs. The American prison system, the British prison system, the British police, they make so much money, or they have spent so much of their time is invested in drugs, that it's business for them. And they don't want to think differently, because to think differently would actually put some of that work. And, and that's what we have to change. And I think the economic argument is the, is the really powerful one. Do you really want to spend half a billion pounds a year just criminalizing young men for possessing cannabis, ruining their lives? Do you really want to spend that money? Well, let's have that argument. Why do we insist that that happens? Simply so that police can get to their targets of, um, of you know, solving crimes. It's outrageous, it's a waste of money, it's a destructive waste of money. But we let it happen because we don't talk about it publicly enough. Other questions? Uh, we will be taking other questions. So if someone can bring up the microphone there. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that the Constitution is written in the language of the people. Yes. Why do you think that the Constitution is written in the language of the people? Yes. Why do you think that the Constitution is written in the language of the people? Yes. Why do you think that the Constitution is written in the language of the people? Yes. Why do you think that the Constitution is written in the language of the people? Yes. Why do you think that the Constitution is written in the language of the people? Yes. Why I wasn't at all surprised that people gave you the reaction you got. Um, my question is a very personal one to you. Uh, you could go around the country getting this kind of response from people who are pissed off. Yeah. Who, I mean, we could be gossiping already about how terrible the government is. How do we actually create agreement in the face of non-agreement? How do we take this further and happier? Yeah. How do we make sure that we engage such and inspire politicians as well, because otherwise this could be just bitchy gossip. Yeah, it's a really important point. And I, I, so the good news is that the, the, the Lib Dems and the Greens are, are on side. I mean, you know, and you saw the Lib Dem drugs minister resigning because because he couldn't even get a, a sensible discussion about drug policy. So after the next election, one has to hope that one or other of those parties will have some influence in government. The position is truly that both the majority of the Tory party and the majority of the Labour party know that the drug laws here are not working. And they know particularly that prohibiting medical cannabis is actually well, bordering on the unethical for the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who find it the only way they can deal with chronic pain and spasticity. They are, but both sides are scared. It's a Mexican standoff. Neither wants to move in because they know if they move, the others will just use that against them in the coming, up, the coming election. So what I'm trying to do is I'm, not, I'm trying to get drugs discussed at this stage, but not particularly as a, a major issue in the election, but because if there is a coalition, it could end up being a factor that decides who's in government. But the time for change is it the beginning of the next government? And if, the, if we have a, you know, a new government with a different leader who's got five years to bring in and change policy and, and then show that it works, then, then that's, I think that's the best time. People won't change the law on drugs towards the end of a government, but they might do it at the beginning. So we have to create enough noise and enough consensus that there is a need for change, that whoever gets into power will have the courage to give it a try. And I think, yes, I think the arguments are there. It is just about political coverage. Next question. Stand up so I can see. Thanks. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. I was just wondering, the graph that you had earlier on, based on drug harm with alcohol at the top, the one with yeah. harm to users and harm to others, I was wondering, when you rank them and you weight them, how do you do that? Is that per population or is that done per use, per user? Right, right. So the, the two colors refer to blues to the user. The average user is the size of the blue bar. And the red bar is the harms to UK society at present. So absolutely, if uh, and you, the, the really interesting comparison there was between alcohol and crystal meth, which crystal meth was the fourth one along. Uh, the harm to the user of crystal meth is greater than that of alcohol, but the harm to British society was tiny because there's very little crystal meth use. If you did the same analysis in the USA, then you would get crystal meth going considerably higher. So sorry, uh, no, I meant in terms of number of users or something? I mean in terms of number of users. Yes, of course. More the more users, users, the more harm to society, almost always, absolutely. And is that the same for harm to user as well? I mean, because No, no, the harm to the user is the is the is the harm to the user. 
It's, a, it's not, you know, that is what an individual who engages in each drug is likely to, how they're likely to harm themselves. Another question? Yeah, if we can put your hands up and get a microphone before. Just, just following on from that, what do you actually mean by harm to society? Harm to society. Okay, so if you read the paper, which is freely available on the Lancet website, there are 16 ways in which drugs harm. Nine harms to the user, from killing you, to making you ill, to giving you um, unpleasant chronic diseases, and seven harms to society. And those harms are damage to the community, economic damage, criminal damage, health costs, international damage, and social damage. So we score each of those, we rank each drug, the 20, the 20 drugs, we rank each drug on each of those scales, and then we get a, what's called a multi-criteria decision analysis, weighting across those seven harms to society, and then the, the weightings change the overall score. So that's how we did it. It's got a sophisticated analysis. It's not a sophisticated analysis of drug harms ever been done. And so it's there, we've gone to the website, the Doug Science website, you can, you can even play around with the numbers if you want, if you don't believe. Question here? Um, how do you think um, educational institutions should react to the increasing use of cognitive enhancers or wakefulness yeah. promoters such as Medapi? So I, I, cognitive enhancers in education establishments, I, my own view is that cognitive enhancers are um, not all they've cracked out to be. I'd be very surprised if any of you do better on a cognitive enhancer than you do just on a simple mixture of good sleep and being quite uh, up for an exam. In fact, there are dangers that you, cognitive enhancers can push you over. And quite regularly now, I get parents writing to me saying, my child took an extra dose of Ritalin before the exam and then had a panic attack. You know, this is a common side effect, and can we plead ignorance to get him out of the fact that he failed the exam? And I say, no, you know, it's probably best you don't take drugs during exams. Um, whether, whether, whether drugs, and certainly, well, no, generally don't, no. Because I don't think they will necessarily help you. So most stimulants just keep you awake longer so you can work longer. But then you have the problem of catch up subsequently. Modafinil, some people say, well, it does help, but the trouble with modafinil is just stinking headache. And so I'm not entirely sure that whether it, you know, it's a little bit more cognitive drive is going to be, um, uh, could be, you know, is, is that necessarily going to be better than if you're confronting side effects like headaches? So I'm not been convinced that there's any data that shows cognition enhancers actually make you better students. Um, my suggestion is, you know, probably don't bother with them, particularly the illegal ones, because if you get caught, then that's the problem. Um, on a related note, I'm wondering, do you have any um, opinions about the prospects of using um, microdoses of psychedelics for nootropic purposes, for purposes of cognitive enhancement? Well, this is, why do you ask that question? <laughs> a, you've done research in the area, and B, I've... Um, you have. No, you. You have. <laughs> well, I'll with it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to prove you've read my papers? Good, good. Yes, yes, absolutely. The second point is um, some of the early like hippie prophets of um, LSD. I think they um, acknowledged that maybe we're using it in the wrong method, yeah. uh, in the wrong way. Maybe we're like overdosing it, and perhaps there are other uses that might be. It's a really interesting question. Yeah, we. Um, of, we're interested in these receptors. They, they, they haven't evolved to regulate brain function for no reason. The question is, what are they there for? Are they there to give you a trip if you take mushrooms or LSD? Probably not. They're probably there to do something with the natural transmitter serotonin. They've probably got something to do with developing, <coughs> learning, cognitive or cortical flexibility. So I think it's a really interesting question whether a low, low doses, sub-psychedelic doses might have beneficial effects. There's this guy called McKenna, and his view is that the reason humans exist is because when the early humans, Astro, Astro, Australopithecus or whatever, started work, you know, living in the, um, the Rift Valley in Africa, they started eating plants which had psychedelics in them, and that the psychedelics made the brain grow. And it's not inconceivable that these receptors have something to do with a massive increase in brain growth that's occurred. You know, the evolution of human brain from apes to us is the fastest evolution of anything in the history of anything. And what 
driving it is not understood. So it might, these receptors might have a role in, in brain growth, brain plasticity. So yes, we are currently in the process of exploring whether sub-psychedelic doses of these drugs might have cognitive benefits, might have neuroplastic benefits as well. But it's very difficult to do because even a non-psychedelic dose is illegal. In fact, even an atom is illegal, or a molecule. Yeah. Shall I tell you a funny story? Yeah. <laughs> so we're doing, we're interested in cannabis. We're interested in this question of skunk versus hash, trying to show, you know, is there a difference? Isn't there a difference? Is cannabidiol protective? So we're doing this wonderful experiment, skunk, hash, placebo. So, you know, we get a license to get skunk from, pure skunk from Holland, we get a license to get your hash in Holland, and we say, send us some placebo, and they say, you need a license. <laughs> and we say, no, no, we just want placebo, and they say, no, no, your home office says you have to have a license. <laughs> so we go to the home office and say, sorry, these Dutch people say we've got to have a license for placebo, and the home office says, of course. Of course you've got to have a, 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 you've got to have a license for placebo. It's not, the, it's not the drug that's illegal, it's the plant. <laughs> Which is, gets to a point where you think, you know, have I taken something? <laughs> <laughs> so then it gets worse, it gets worse. <laughs> so you go to the Home Office website and you try to find the drop-down box for ordering a license for placebo. There is not one. <laughs> So it's like Kafka, you know, you, so then you say, well, do you know, how do we order placebo? Oh, oh, oh. so now there is a drop-down box for placebo, but isn't, isn't that beyond absurd that, that you actually can't, it's not, the, you know, just, if the plant looks like a cannabis plant, it's illegal. And that's, of course, why hemp is illegal. Yeah. Next question. The, uh, we sorry. have time for just four more questions. We're going to take that one up there, one below. And then okay. we'll see the last two. Um, the, the drugs and alcohol is a pretty emotive issue. And um, well, what I'd like to ask is how can we, as, as doctors and scientists in the future, or anybody that interacts with the public, how can we encourage people to um, engage with the evidence rather than with ideology? Yeah. And then maybe the votes will change after, after that. Yeah, so the really important, the, 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 the critical thing is here, right? You read that? Buy this book for your parents. Because <laughs> it's your parents who vote, not you. So the two things, never buy the daily. Destroy all copies of the daily mail in your parents' nose. And tell them, buy this book and explain to them that they can have a rational view of drugs. When, obviously, get engaged with us, follow us, follow me, write to the blog. I don't know if any of you, did any of you see the thing I did in The Guardian on PMA last week? Yeah, with that. You know, there were a thousand comments. There were so many comments that the Guardian decided its own science correspondent would do a piece on it. Do those things, follow us, make a lot of noise, because that noise eventually permeates through the, the Twitter sphere and the alto meter sphere, and people take notice. And any time someone lies or tells you something that is untrue about drugs, or any time someone says cannabis causes schizophrenia, you say, no, it doesn't. And anyone, anyone time someone says alcohol protects against heart disease, you say alcohol might, but the, the optimal dose of alcohol to protect against heart disease is a third of a pint a day. So don't drink more than that if you really think there's a health benefit. Every time people are distorting the truth, challenge them. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, you, make a, you make a comparison between uh, uh, alcohol, damage from alcohol, harm from alcohol, and drugs which are illegal. You know, obviously, there is a massive infrastructure behind the distribution of alcohol and a lack of social taboo about consuming it. Are there any models about what would happen if yeah. all substances were, were illegal yeah. and what the consumption patterns would be and the damage yeah. would be there? Well, when people ask me this question and they say, but cannabis surely, surely is going to be really dangerous and destructive if we open the gates. And I say, well, you know, we've got some examples actually, you know, one's called Jamaica. I mean, Jamaica's still functioning quite well. They've got some damn good runners. And, um, <laughs> and the cannabis has effectively been legal there forever. And then you look at the Netherlands. The Netherlands have had legal cannabis for 30 years. They've set up the coffee shops. Why didn't they set up the coffee shops? Because they didn't want their kids buying cannabis from people who'd sell them heroin. Did it work? Yes, it did. They have the lowest rates of youth heroin use in Europe. Do they have problems with cannabis? 
No. Do they have a better football team than us? Yes. <laughs> what more do you want? Yeah, there are. One of the interesting things, of course, is this new rise in, um, in can medical cannabis in the USA. And two fascinating new pieces of data have come out of the USA in the last year. The first is states which allow people to use cannabis more liberally have less deaths from alcohol on the roads. Because, you know, as I said earlier on, if you're stoned, you tend not to run. But the more interesting one that's come out just in the last two months is that deaths from prescription opiates have gone down. Because a lot of people in pain are taking opiates, and it's easy to overdose on opiates. And if they switch to cannabis, you can overdose on cannabis. So, so we're going to see, I think, a much more rational use of drugs like cannabis, uh, which is going to reduce the damage from alcohol, and actually not particularly increase harms from, from that, um, that drug itself. Think so? Two last questions. One here with the microphone. I'm sorry, uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering, because you're talking about say, the positive effects and stuff, but now if we think of a negative effects, for example... Could you speak a little bit slower? Please? Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so you talked about the positive effects, about MDMA, for instance. Yes, yes. But you know, for example, the negative effects that people say, oh, I've got to calm down, yeah. I'm feeling dreadful, depressive, no, 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 no. What have you noticed in the study about MDMA that you did about that? Yeah, so, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, let me be clear, no drug is safe. I mean, the, even alcohol, as we've shown you, alcohol killed Leobets. Um, so, sorry, water killed Leobets. Um, so, MDMA clearly isn't safe. The harms of MDMA, though, are largely driven by the effects of what you do when you're on it. So, I think MDMA as a therapy is going to be completely harmless. Those patients that have been put through those PTSD trials have been followed up for five years now, there's no evidence of any cognitive problems. But if you take a lot of MDMA and you spend hours and hours dancing and possibly get dehydrated, you're going to get exhausted and then there's going to be time to recover. I, it's not, it's possible that MDMA could affect the brain, it could affect serotonin systems in the brain. The, the evidence is certainly not convincing, but it's not impossible. Um, my own view is that and we should, we, it would be possible to make a safer version of MDMA that doesn't, that has less of the risks than that. In fact, we know there are some out there. I examined a thesis just on Friday in Finland looking at other variants of MDMA which are less damaging to the serotonin system. So, so there are compounds which could be used instead of MDMA which are safer. But overall, I think the, the fact that you know, a million young people have been using MDMA now for the last 30 years, we've seen very little in the way of long-term consequences. So, it's, it's, it's a relatively safe drug. There's the last question. Final question. Last question. Um, I've got two questions, which are twofold, but very brief. The first question is, if any of us are interested in maybe being involved in participants, and any of you are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how might you get involved? Just email me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and send it to me on Twitter or send, yeah, send, it to drug, send your name to Drug Science on Twitter or to me on Twitter. Yeah. And I'll put you in touch with the, um, with the people that keep the list of volunteers. Yes. Okay. Um, and the second question is, what's the most interesting experience that you personally have ever had with drugs? Yes. <laughs> If you happen to put off by alcohol because of relative dangers, we'll be adjourning to the Institute of Education Bar where you can have your third pint. <laughs>